Welcome back to another Founding Friday. When um, I first had the idea of uh, Founders Fridays, uh, I didn't even know if anybody would watch them. And they are some of our highest rated shows that we have had, our highest rated Fridays out of all my whole time in television. America is hungry for the truth that they never learned. And the idea is pretty simple. We spend an hour telling stories of our founders um, that you've never heard before. Have Americans fall in love with the people that started this country all over again? And it's really not that hard to do. Their courage, their determination, their, their fearlessness, their stubbornness. I fell in love with these three guys. This guy is absolutely incredible. Ben Franklin, there's nobody like him on planet Earth today. George Washington, I hope that we can find our George Washington. Honorable trustworthy, decent. Samuel Adams, oh my gosh, he'd be in some sort of PC jail now. He's so unbelievably religious and didn't mind anybody saying, hey, Sam, have a seat, stop with the God stuff. Except in his time, really nobody was saying that. I wanted to tell you about history because I've fallen in love with American history. It's the history of our country and it's not being taught anymore. You want to save our country? You can talk about politics all you want, but you want to save our country. You've got to know who we are. I was out on the road last weekend. Um, I was in um, St. Louis and Columbus, Ohio. And everybody I met, everybody was talking about Founding Fridays. Oh, the Founding Fridays, man, it's the best. They were talking about history. History. When was the last time that was happening in this country? But there was one show that has stood out in particular to most people on these Friday shows. And I think it's because there's a, there's a whole section of our history that has been completely wiped off the face of the earth. It is a story of a group of people that are courageous. They are founders that nobody even talks about anymore. Nobody even knew that they were existing. They did up until around the Civil War. They are our black founders. At first, I wasn't sure how people would react to the show. Quite honestly, um, after the program, I spent about 20 minutes with the audience, and a lot of them were really hacked off. They were angry that a huge piece of American history had been eliminated. After the show, I talked to uh, a couple of uh, African Americans that work on the staff, and they, Jack, where's Jack? Is he still here? Jack was uh, talking to me. He's our sound guy, and he said, I talked to my father afterwards, my son. He said, I understand. He said, my son watched the show with me. He said, stood up and swore. He said, he doesn't swear in front of his father. He says, I'm sorry, Dad. I can understand maybe why your generation didn't learn this, but why didn't we? People in the audience, and I want to show you a little clip of what happened after the show, couldn't believe what they were hearing. Watch. Liberal Democrats didn't jump on the civil rights train until it became politically convenient to do yeah. so. What is this anti-American sentiment that, that's going on? LBJ and JFK are, are lauded in the black community, but they didn't support the Civil Rights Act of 1957. How precisely did Woodrow Wilson become lionized by the progressive movement? Well, he didn't like the founders, he didn't like the Constitution. He didn't like the sure. country. Yeah. He was, what, the president of Princeton? He was Princeton, president of Princeton. Of Princeton University. Governor of New York. Democrat, um, an avowed racist. How exactly did all of this get expunged from history? They named scholarships for minorities after this man. Oh. <laughs> and it's infuriating oh, when you think well, about it. The that's progressive right. That's right. that the sure evil came, that's right. that came out of. And again, you don't know this because Wilson was a prophet. That's right. The expert. Non Crispus addicts. He perhaps was the first American killed in the Revolutionary War. And we don't know, most people don't know that. He was a black man. He is the only one from the founding era that I've seen taught in public textbooks for the last 40 years is Crispus addicts. Nobody else. This is an incredible show. Um, I'm going to spend some more time learning about our black founders and restoring this part of history. All this summer, you are going to learn things. You are going to learn things. <laughs> that I am convinced will change the course of this country. We are going to set history right again. Find out who we really, truly are. So much of our differences will be erased. 
so many of the problems that we face now, we don't have to face. Uh, things have been erased to separate us. This is a book that I want you to pick up, American History in Black and White. It's been now on the Amazon bestseller list for a while, uh, since really since that show. Uh, David Barton is uh, here. He's the founder and president of Wall Builders and author of American History in Black and White. And David, I have to tell you, I was reading this book. It's, it's, it's an easy read, and it's only, it really only scratches the surface. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have to tell you, I was ashamed of myself. I started to read this, and I saw this. Um, this is a Thanksgiving sermon, preached January 1st, 1808. And so I'm reading this sermon. Who is it given by, David? Absalom Jones, the Who? Reverend Absalom Jones. Who is he? He is a black founder. Mm -hmm. He is the first black Episcopal bishop. He is the guy who served with signer of the Declaration, Benjamin Rush, to treat the yellow fever epidemic of 1793. Probably the first black trained physician trained by signer of the Declaration. Uh, but that's really, a, an, uh, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember right, really an amazing physician oh, yeah. as well. He right? was. He and Richard Allen. But it was, it was an amazing thing when that yellow fever epidemic of 1793 hit. Philadelphia was where it hit. That was the national capital. You had President Washington there. You had the House, the the, the Senate. The it hits. Nobody knows what causes yellow fever back then. Who knew that it was mosquitoes? Forty thousand people in town. It killed four thousand people. So wow. ten percent of the, the population. Doctors don't know what caused it. You got dozens of doctors in Philadelphia. They all left town except Dr. Benjamin Rush. He said, "God called me to serve and med. I'm not leaving because it's dangerous." The other two guys that stayed were two black preachers, Richard Allen, Absalom Jones. Those three guys took care of 30,000 folks in Philadelphia themselves. On top of that, Absalom Jones and Richard Allen would bury up to 120 folks a day that died as a result of yellow fever. Oh Everybody else has le left town. I mean, they're, okay. they're gone. All right, so now wait a minute. Um, uh, uh, Richard Allen was also... Um, he was a preacher at a white church, right? A mega church. A, a mega church. He, he, was, he would preach to 2,000 whites at a church in Philadelphia. He, he was, Again, give me the year. And this is about 1790s. Okay. How many here in the audience have been led to believe that in the 1790s, blacks and whites hated each other, it was slavery, right? And how many people, raise your hand, how many people said, look at that. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. We, just, we just hated each other. Yeah. Actually, the truth is, with Richard Allen, this mega, mega preacher, he tried to segregate. Yeah. Tell me the story. In the 1790s, he proposed having a black denomination. And both whites and blacks said, we don't want to do that. No, we want the integrated stuff. We don't, we don't want separate denominations. There was finally an overt act of racism in one church that kind of gave him the impetus to go ahead and start a black denomination. But for years, neither blacks nor whites wanted a separate denomination because they worshiped together in, in those churches in Philadelphia okay. and elsewhere. All right. Um, that's not to say that there weren't racists. At the no, time. there absolutely were. There's always racists. Uh, yep. There always will be. Um, all right. So I'm reading this book, and I'm reading, um, I'm reading this sermon. Um, and I have to tell you, I'm ashamed of myself because I come to this, I come to this part. In behalf of our brethren, it becomes us this day to offer our united thanks. Let the song of angels, which was first heard in the air, the birth of our Savior, be heard on this day in assembly. Let us sing psalms to him and talk of all of his wondrous works. Let, listen to this, let the first day of January be set apart every year as a day of thanksgiving. And when our children shall ask in time to come, saying, what mean the lessons, the psalms, the prayers, and the praises in the worship of this day? Let us answer them by saying, The Lord, on the day of which this is the anniversary, did what? Does anybody want to say? Has anybody ever heard of this? The first of January should be celebrated in the entire country every year. And when our children, it should be such a big deal that when our children come and say, What is the meaning of the celebration on the 1st of January. Anybody? One. Uh, the Constitution states that uh, not until 1808 can you uh, abolish the African slave trade. So that is a date, uh, January 1st. Uh, Abraham Lincoln actually talks about it in hot haste. Uh, they put that law into effect. Okay. How many people knew that? Do you know when, now remember, England is known for abolishing the slave trade uh, peacefully, et cetera, et cetera. They did it in 1807. They didn't abolish slavery 
just the trade of slaves uh, in 1807. We did it in 1808. They beat us by a year. But David, what is the meaning of the celebration on the 1st of January? Anybody? One. Uh, the Constitution states that uh, not until 1808 can you uh, abolish the African slave trade. So that is a date, uh, January 1st. Uh, Abraham Lincoln actually talks about it in hot haste. Uh, they put that law into effect. Okay. How many people knew that? Do you know when... Now remember, England is known for abolishing the slave trade uh, peacefully, etc., etc. They did it in 1807. They didn't abolish slavery just the trade of slaves uh, in 1807. We did it in 1808. They beat us by a year, but David? They help actually me out. didn't beat us by a year because we wrote that provision back in 1787 at the Constitutional Convention. Now, we gave, the, there were three southern states particularly that wanted to keep slavery. The other states wanted to get rid of it. And the three states said, if you'll give us a little bit of time, we'll, we'll do this. I said, okay, we'll give you 20 years, then we want it done. We, we want it gone. And that was supposed to be the time. So back in 1787, that's what they planned for, for this state. David, when did this history start to get erased? When did, when did we lose? Um, because it was done for a reason. Yeah. There's no way that systematically yeah. this can be, you know, there's, there's some things that you can lose. Oh, I didn't know that fact or I didn't know mm -hmm. that fact. But this is like the Statue of Liberty standing there. Yeah. And everybody's like, I don't know what that big lady is. And nobody knowing. That's right. And, and, and in fact, it's not only that we don't know who the big lady is. We're like, you know who that big lady is? She is, she is the president of Halloween Town. And she comes and she takes your <laughs> yeah. children with yeah. a torch. I mean, that's, that's yeah. almost what it is. Yeah. We have not just forgotten history. We have turned it upside down yeah. to use it to hate each other. Mm -hmm. There was a whole period of time, founding fathers passed anti-slavery law after anti-slavery law. 1789, they abolished slavery in any new territory. You couldn't become part of the United States if you had slavery. 1794, they banned the exportation of slaves. 1808, they banned the importation of slaves and slave trade. They're going through really great. 1820, Congress starts passing laws. They said, you remember that law the founders said about no states having slaves? We don't like that. We're going to repeal that. So the repeal of the 1789 law put in the Missouri Compromise said if you come in with the free state, you've got to come in the slave state. So the next 12 states that came in were, were mixed. Then they, they keep repealing laws, and they get to the 1850, the Fugitive Slave Law, 1850, Kansas-Nebraska Act. They're, they're becoming more and more pro-slavery. So to do that, they do what people today have to do, and that is you have to rewrite history to justify your agenda. I was in, uh, this is a, maybe a year or so ago, um, and uh, maybe probably about two years now, maybe. And I'm, I'm just starting to learn my history and, you know, really starting to be really curious about all of this stuff in American history. And I just accepted the line, you know, that I had learned in, in school. And I found myself down in, I think, Richmond, Virginia. Is that where the Confederate Museum is? Richmond, it's, Virginia. it's one of the museums, sure. And um, I'm, I'm down there, and I'm, I'm in the gift shop, and I'm looking for a Confederate Constitution. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen those, you know, where you get the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, and it's in a little envelope, and it's like all that really crappy parchment yeah. paper. And that's what I'm looking for. And the guy who's with me, um, I said, I've got to find the Confederate Constitution. I want to read it. And so <laughs> he just goes to the curator of the museum, and he says, do you have a copy of the Confederate Constitution? Glenn Beck is here, and he'd like to read it. And the guy says, oh, sure, absolutely. Next thing I know, he's like, uh, yeah, well, it's upstairs. I'm like... Okay, you keep the little envelopes upstairs, okay? I go up, and he takes out a box, and it's the original Actually. Constitution. And he rolls it out onto the table, and I'm like, I may have jam on my hands. I don't think this, <laughs> this is not a good idea. Um, but I read it, and I actually look at all of it, and I read it. It was clearly, this wasn't about state rights. This was clearly about slavery. It was. Um, you can say whatever you want about state rights. It wasn't about state rights when you, to join the Confederacy, you had, had to, be. to be a slave And state. you couldn't stay in the Confederacy if you ended slave. Correct. If, if it's a slave, I mean, if it it's states', states rights, rights, states get to choose. Exactly right. And so. there's a reason, too, that the title on it was called the slaveholding Confederate States of America. That's part of the title. Yeah. Now, we never say that. Yeah, I, I, I tell you, I learned more just from having that Reading thing. the Constitution. Just Absolutely. reading the Constitution. Absolutely. It's amazing what you can learn, America, from reading a Constitution. 
We should try it sometime. <laughs> what do you say? All right. Um, I want to take a break. How much time do I have? Because I don't want to get in. I've, I've got some stuff here on. on yeah, okay. We're going to take a break. And I, when we come back, I, I want to show you what was in the newspaper, in the death announcements um, of people who fought in the Revolutionary War. Oh, you won't believe the racism or the lack of it. Next. David Barton, founder and president of Wall Builders, um, he is an he's an amazing guy because you can, you know, when I get on and I say, you know, here's here's what I think is going on, you can dispute that all you want because that's our, that's my opinion. But when we talk about history and you can produce the documents, and that's why I really believe um, David Barton is uh, one of the most important people in uh, in America to save America today because. In, he'll give you his opinion, but he'll produce the documents to show you the fact. What was the relationship of our founders with African Americans? Depends on where you were. If you're in the South, it's a different relationship, right? It was. But our founders, uh, the ones that really put everything together, um, they, they, they came from a world where we don't even understand it. We're just, we're striving. Yeah to get back to this place, yeah. are we not? We are. Um, and I want to show, the, now these are, these are just, uh, these are from old newspapers. This one is Caesar Glover, a colored man supposed to be about 80 years of age. This is a, a, a um, obituary. obituary. Uh, he was brought from Africa as a slave when a child. He served in the Revolutionary War and is one of the pensioners of the United States. What does this tell you? Several things. That is a list of obituaries. It's not broken out black and white. He's right in with every, he's just a citizen. They're just telling you who's died. Didn't matter whether you were black or white or anything else, you're a citizen. But significantly there is the word pensioner. He's a pensioner of the United States. Now, what's that? Well, that goes with the veterans' benefits that were provided. Now, here, here's a document. You know, take that. He's always make me nervous. This is original, the last official address of His Excellency George Washington. This is his original from what year? 1783. This is when he resigns after we've won the revolution. Eight years, we now win it. He's going out. He has a message to the governors of 13 states, and he has a message to Congress. And, hey, Congress, by the way, this is what we need to do to take care of our veterans. Here, here's the kind of benefits we need to provide uh, for the officers. We want to give them a half pension for, for what they were getting. And, and, and so this is the first veterans benefit bill program that Washington sets forth. Okay. Tell me about the, the classes of African American and Exactly. He's a, he's a pensioner of the United States. He's not a white pensioner or a black pensioner. He's a soldier. He served his country. He gets the pension. We didn't have... So there's no, there's no discussion no, of no, color in no, this not at, at all. all. Not at Everybody... All. As a matter of fact, you know, we talked about Crispus, Crispus Attucks earlier, yeah. who first, first guy shot down in the American Revolution. Um, he was black. The other four guys shot down that day were white. He was laid in state at Fanula Hall and laid in state for four days there for everybody to see. Now, there's black lane in state. No, no paper ever even mentioned that he was black. It was not an issue. He was the guy who got shot down standing up for his country. And so these five guys got shot down. It wasn't until we got into the racism preceding the Civil War that the abolitionists had to say, hey, remember, our first martyr here was a, was a black American. Nobody cared about it back in the early days because he is a soldier who fought for his country. He's a patriot. He laid in state right there. Okay, this one is um, uh, at Providence at an advanced age, Bristol Rhodes, a black man of the late Revolutionary Army, in which he long served with deserved reputation at the siege of New York uh, of Yorktown. He was severely wounded, having misfortune, un unfortunately lost a leg and an arm, and has since assisted on pension. Same story. Same story. Um, a colored man named Henry Hill, 
uh, died at Chillicothe not long since the age of 80 years. He served faithfully in the Revolutionary War and was a participant in the battles of Lexington, Brandywine, uh, Monmouth, and Princeton and Yorktown. He was interned with honors of the war. What does that mean? Not only a pension, but he got a full military funeral as any veteran would get. So that's a military funeral with all the honors that go with being a veteran. How many people here had any idea that our founders, uh, the people at this time, would, would take an African American and bury them with the full military rights and honors. Anybody here believe that before just now? <laughs> Your wife. She... <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. And the last one here, what is, uh, what is interesting is, this? Is, this is a little change of pace, but what, you, you can read what it is. Here's another black elected to office. A free Negro man in the name of Thomas Hercules was on the sixth day of July uh, chosen town clerk of that bureau by decided majority of votes. This, we mentioned, is proof of the growing liberally, uh, liberality. liberality of the present age when virtue and worth alone and not mere color or tippery of rank and splendor begin the uh, begin to recommend a man uh, what Pl uh, places of places of trust and confidence. trust and confidence he got elected because of his worth and abilities it wasn't because of what color he was or wasn't it wasn't because of him scheming for does, office does this not sound like Martin Luther King <laughs> This sounds like Martin Luther That's King. That's a 1792 newspaper. 1792. 1792. And blacks elected office is just a matter of fact in the newspaper. Again, if you don't know history, you repeat it. Yeah. Look what we did. We repeated it. We made progress, and then it was erased, and so we repeated it. Yeah. David, what was the, what was the thing that you found in... Um, you or anybody else that started going through stuff and you went, I, 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 I can't believe this. Was there anything that really just opened your eyes on this particular subject that you thought, Nobody, nobody knows this. What, what opened my eyes was in the state of Texas because I was walking through the Texas state capitol and I was just wandering around. I had some time between some meetings and I was wandering around and back under a stairway. And I mean, I was going into the nooks and crannies back under a stairway they, they have all over the Capitol, they've got big posters of all the people who served in the 15th legislature, the 16th or 17th, and a bunch of them were missing, and they were tucked away back under the steps of the Capitol. And I walked back there and looked at them, they were all black guys. We, we had legislatures in Texas that were probably 60, 70 percent black. And I looked at those guys and said, I've never heard this. And so I, I started writing down names, and I went and started looking them up. These guys elected to office in early Texas and were some of our leaders. I, Matthew Gaines, I love, was a black senator, did the first faith-based program in the nation, came out of Texas for the black senator doing it. I never heard of Matthew When Gaines. were they put underneath the stairwell? That's what I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. They were put under the stairwell. I found them back there, and that's what kind of opened my eyes. And I started looking. I found that to be true in most of the southern states. Most of the southern states put um, Lewis... Lucas Morrell, when, when we were on, on the first program, he talked about this is the only time in American history where losers wrote the history. Mm -hmm. The Confederate guys wrote the history. They wrote the blacks right out of history, and they stuck the, these prominent leaders back under the stairway so no one would see them. And I find that across those, those old Confederate states. America, it's time to bring them out from underneath the stairway. And it is time to learn the truth of our history that will unite us and bring us together. More in a second. tonight and there is so much history here that we can't squeeze it into an hour or in this case two and soon to be three four five six seven eight nine ten there is a lot coming this summer that you do not want to miss go to glenbeck.com sign up for insider extreme tonight we premiere a new rock stars of the revolution you'll hear everything that david barton has to say about our black founders plus you will learn stuff that you have never 
read in textbooks. Never. David Barton, founder and president of the Wall Builders, he's also the author of a great book, American History in Black and White. David, I want to I talk to you about, um, I'm starting to collect textbooks. Right. And um, we uh, were talking about it in my office just the other day. We can open up textbooks, depending on which one and where it's from, and see what they're teaching in school. And we know, because like you, you've gone to the original sources. I've read, uh, in fact, I, I had some on the set earlier. I've read the diaries of some of these people. Yeah. I, I've, I mean, I've read, I've seen, I've touched the documents. Yeah. And you read the textbooks, and it's completely upside down. Yeah. Is there... Is there a way, uh, if, by not passing through the gates of academia, uh, you know, because they hold all the keys, um, uh, is there a way to restore this history? Yeah. And is there how? I'm going to use the Texas model for an example, because we talked in the last program about how every one of these black guys we just mentioned we now have back in the Texas textbooks, and because of the nature of the textbook market, that's coming to all 49 other states. I mean, mm -hmm. this will affect all national standards. This started 15 years ago. There are 15 elected State Board of Education members in Texas. That's a down-ballot race. Nobody ever pays attention to it. They're all elected. Each one comes from a, con from a district the size of two congressional districts. We started 15 years ago saying, you know what, if we're ever going to change the content of textbooks, we're going to have to look at the people who are in charge of what goes in the textbooks. And we started electing solid, conservative, traditional, patriotic, American, common-sense people 15 years ago. We finally got to where we have a majority on the board. And it came just in time for all these votes that we had on these history standards. They, you know, it was the academics that chewed us up and, and came after us, but these common sense people that we... That's all I want. I don't want a conservative or liberal That's or whatever. Right. I just want somebody who doesn't, accurate. doesn't hate the country. That's right. Um, when it's a coin toss, give, it, yep. you know, give the coin toss to us or even put up in the textbook. It's a coin toss. We're not sure. That's right. You know what I mean? It's a coin toss. Um, but also somebody who just... Roots it in fact. That's right. Because it's, it's so distorted. It is. Well, one of the things that, that, that I did in going through this, helping these guys analyze it, was I said, okay, look at the heroes that they have given us. Because 240 school teachers put together the standards. We're supposed to edit it, and they vote on it. So we looked at all the, the hundred and some odd names, and overt liberals outnumbered overt conservatives by four to one margin. I said, let, let's at least get some balance in here. You know, let, yeah. let, let's get some. And we started adding these good guys. And, of course, they screamed, oh, you're turning the textbooks to the right. No, we're just bringing them back to even well, What about black and white? Black and white, as far as the textbooks, what was interesting was the last standards done 12 years ago, 11% of the names mentioned in the textbook were non-white. The ones we just did is now up to 25%. We've Jeez. increased that number significantly, and they're screaming at us because we turned it conservative. No, we're just starting to teach history the way it actually happened. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. tell, me one, tell me one of the, the stories that you... I've got some good friends that are in Special Forces, and those guys, are they're really cool dudes in Special Forces. And that goes back to OSS and World War II, mm -hmm. and then we came up with John F. Kennedy, Navy SEALs, and, 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 and Special Forces. We had special forces back in the American Revolution. One of the first examples was in December of 1776, our second in command, General Charles Lee, got captured by the British. Only way we're going to get him back is to capture a British general of equal rank and make a prisoner exchange. Mm. So what they do is they come up with this commando-type plan, a, a snatch and grab. We've got to go in there in the middle of this big British fort where the number two general is, snatch the guy, get him out without the British knowing, then we'll make an exchange. So up in Newport, Rhode Island, where the British were, General Richard Prescott w was the number two general, and they came up with a plan to go in, right in the middle of his massive in installation and catch him and get him out. And so Lieutenant Colonel William Barton came up with a plan. He went to his 40 top soldiers, he's an American, he went to his 40 top soldiers, black and white, got them all together and said, guys, here, here's what I propose. We're going to go in at night, we're going to capture him in his, in his sleeping quarters at night, we're going to have to go by all the, the British warships, have to go by all the guards, we'll get there, we'll capture him, we'll bring him out, and then we'll make the exchange. And he said, this probably gets you killed. Anybody want to do this? All 40 raised their hands and volunteered. I want, I want to go. So they got in the rowboats. They put clothing around the oars so that when they were rowing, the muffled sound, they rowed right under the, the prow of the British warships, rowed right up on, on the, the land where all the guards were. They snuck up on the British guards, knocked them all out, tied them up, secured them. They finally found their way back to his quarters, and they got there, and his door was locked. 
And, you know, what do you do now? Sucked. <laughs> yeah. Did anybody bring a key? Exactly. What are you thinking, man? Exactly. Right. It, it, it's locked. It's like, oh, gosh, how do we do this quiet? And they're, they're wondering about what to do. And a black patriot, Prince Sisson, said, move out of the way. Just shoved him aside. He ran at the door, used his head as a battering ram. Hit the door. The door cracked, but it didn't go through. He backed up, hit it a second time, and it exploded. And they went in. And the, of course, the British general is absolutely shocked. You know what just happened to his door? And Prince Sisson is the guy who just—he's uh, a door kicker. Uh, my son-in-law, we call him a door kicker because he's mm -hmm. three tours in Iraq. But this was a door kicker from way back then. And he broke that door in, went and captured the general. They brought him out, muffled it, and brought him back across. They made a successful prisoner exchange. So that's your first special forces operation in the American Revolution. Chris. I'm 37 years old, been out of high school for almost 20 years. I actually went to some of the best schools available, which is Department of Defense Dependent Schools overseas in Germany. And I felt like I got a great education. But what's really upsetting, especially since I've seen David Barton before and also watching the show, really just hacked me off, as you said, is that I'm just now finding out about these things. I looked at some textbooks from friends of mine who were like, you know, still in school. They're still teaching about the same four to five standard black yeah. people in history. Pretty much it's always Harriet Tubman, Crispus Attucks, uh, uh, Frederick Douglass. Uh, some of them mentioned Benjamin Banneker. But it, it's always the same four yeah. or five as if there was only four or five black people who contributed to this country throughout its history. And it's just like, why is this still the same way with all the information okay. we have today? in 2010. May, may I ask a question, because Javier and, and Cynthia, you are shaking your heads while he's saying this, and you look a little disgusted um, by this whole thing. Can, can you pass, Chris, can you pass Javier a, a microphone? Because, you, I mean, it's, it's robbing heritage. Absolutely. And I was president in the audience at your last show where you did this, and I had some very strong comments that I made about Woodrow Wilson yeah. um, and what I mentioned specifically on that show was the fact that what I found particularly galling in that instance was uh, there are scholarships for minorities uh, named after Woodrow Wilson right. um, and I find a lot of this particularly inf infuriating because like Chris I went to some very good schools um, and these are names aside from maybe one or two of them that I had never been exposed to um, and I had never heard about until you know, this day or the last show that we had, the very first time that you had had this discussion. Cynthia, what, how do you feel? Well, this is my first time ever hearing this, and I'm a little appalled. I mean, I'm not that far removed from even college, and I took African-American courses, and some of this stuff is I'm hearing for the first time. And, I mean, public education, one thing, but when you're paying for your education and you're not getting this information, it's really, really sad. I got news for you. We're paying for all of our... <laughs> They're paying for everybody's education. Thank you, Stephen. Um, you had a, uh, a question. In 1722, um, England created. 1772? Or 1772, my bad. Um, England created a law ending the slave trade. The slave trade continued, anyways, and America continued to get slaves. And three years later, the American Revolution started. The Amer and do you believe that this? law contributed to the beginning of the American Revolution. Stand by. We'll get that answer and more from the audience in just a second. I just said to David right before we went on the air that uh, I've gotten to the chills like three times um, this episode because I just know this is the answer. The, the answer to our problems, restoration. Um, I, I'm reading, we were talking in the break, I'm reading a book called uh, The Children, which is the story of um, uh, the 1960 and the beginning of the civil rights movement and, and what these people went through. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. And I don't know a lot of that history, because there's this barrier, imagined or not, there's this barrier. Um, how many African Americans don't know the history of these guys and the, uh, uh, the American Revolution? When we restore that history, and we restore the truth about segregation and all of the nastiness there, 
whites and blacks can just knit together because we've both been lied to. Yeah. We really have both been lied to. Now, Stephen asked a question before we, we uh, took a break. Great Britain, 1772, wiped out slavery or passed a law to do so. Did it have any impact in America, even though the British didn't follow it? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes. In 1773, Rhode Island started passing anti-slavery laws. In 1774, Massachusetts started passing anti-slavery laws. Uh, Pennsylvania passed anti-slavery laws because they now have the permission to do so. In 1774, after all these states start passing them, King George III came in and vetoed every American anti-slavery law. He said, oh, stop. You guys part of the British Empire. We have slavery in the British Empire. As long as you're part of the British Empire, you're going to have slavery. And that's where several founders said, great, let's not make part of the British Empire anymore. So mm -hmm. given the opportunity, you'll wow. find that in the original declaration, the desire to end slavery is listed twice as often as taxation without representation. Twice as often. We hear taxation. We don't hear the desire to end slavery. Deneen. Uh, your book is great. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Have you considered doing your own Black History Month? Because we're doing a poor job of it. <laughs> we actually have. On our website, we, we've come out with a number of, of Black History little magazines just telling stories of these guys. And, and they're on our website, and you can get these things. But I, I tell you, I have a blast. These are my heroes. I mean, I'm an American. These are Americans. I love good models. And we just didn't know these guys. And, and so we, we enjoy digging back in. And I'll, I'll say... This is an old 1855 textbook. It is not a skinny textbook. There is nothing but black patriots of the American Revolution in that. It's not like we're shallow on black patriots. What That's is the name all of this that book? is. That is uh, Colored Patriots of the American Revolution, William Nell. Who here even knew? In 1850, 1855. 1855, there was a school textbook, Colored Patriots. Who even knew that? It, it hasn't been reprinted, but it's on Google Books. If you want to read that book, go to Google Books and you can read And it's done by a black historian, William Nell, who's the first black to hold any federal office in, in the federal government. Jen. Um, I'm, I'm really angry about the rewriting of history and, you know, all this history that's not included in, this, in the school's textbooks. And for me, anger motivates me. And aside from the good work of Mr. Barton, and even assuming, like you said, if, if these textbooks um, start to include all of this excellent history, you know, I, I'm still cynical that even the public school system will teach it in a way that doesn't twist it mm -hmm. almost to the negative. And I want to know what else um, that we can do and what other efforts are underway to get this. Um, okay. Let, let, let's, answer, let's answer that question because I think that is a critical, critical question and a critical answer. We'll do that next. Uh, Jan asked this. Is it Jen or Jen? Jen. Jen asked this the question uh, about, you know, uh, what do you do? Uh, David, uh, you have to be a part of the school district. You have to yeah. be involved in the textbooks and everything that you're doing in Texas. And people have to be involved with their schools. But uh, correct me if you think I'm wrong. America, I think we're running out of time. <laughs> um, and this is, I, I really view our children as clay jars. Um, and it is the scripture. Can, we, can I have that book? Yes, this sir. Is the, this, is, this is the scripture, American scripture, uh, colored patriots. If we lose it with all of this freedom and technology, it will never be seen again if something goes awry. Um, we must not only learn it, seek it out, but teach it to our children and make sure they know it and waste no time. Do you and we've got to be intolerant of school districts who won't teach it. Because if we know it and teach our kids, then we've got a basis to go, look at the textbooks right. you've got. You've admitted this guy and this guy right. and this guy and this guy. And, and make it so intolerant they have to get different textbooks. I'm trying to write a book for Christmas that'll be for kids. It's on American heroes and patriots. Mm -hmm. And it will show the textbooks off to the side. It'll show this is what you're gonna learn in your textbooks. And this is where you find the information that shows that's wrong. So we can teach our children not only the true stories, but then teach our te children to find the right answer, and then stand up respectfully to their um, teachers. The other thing I, I want to mention to you is um, um, the last um, uh, American revival that I'm, I'm doing. We've done, what, three of these, and they've yeah. been sold out, 10,000 people each. We're doing the last one in July in Salt Lake City. It's Saturday, I think the 17th of July. Tickets are available. We'll put it at the bottom of the screen. I think it's glenbecktours.com. 
but it's a seven hour event. This isn't for somebody who just wants, you know, hey, I'm just going to go have a good time. You'll have a great time. It's almost a spiritual event, it really is. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that you learn. And the only complaint we've had on this is people say, can you turn the house lights up a little more? Because I want to take more notes. Um, it is up to you to be able to preserve this. You must get active. The most important thing you can do is read history. Read, search, question with boldness even the very existence of God. And then teach it to your children. We'll be back. Final thoughts next. All right, we're going to leave things tonight with Vanessa. I just think that, like Marcus Garvey said, a people without knowledge of their history is like a tree without roots. And this history is really important so that we can change the victim narrative that's monopolized the conversation. And the same for everyone that is an American. We've got to know our roots. From New York, good night, America.